Welcome, welcome, welcome to Parapsychology Foundation Presents Book Expo 2015. Here are all our wonderful speakers. And I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to read this biography, a little bit about the book, and then we will turn this over to Jim. We have today Professor Jim Tucker. He's Bonner Laurie Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at the University of Virginia. He's continuing the work of Dr. Ian Stevenson at the University of Virginia Division of Perceptual Studies with children who report memories of previous lives. His overview of the research, Life Before Life, a scientific investigation of children's memories of previous lives, has been translated into 10 languages. His latest book, New York Times bestseller, Return to Life, Extraordinary Cases of Children Who Remember Past Lives, is a collection of recent American cases he has studied with theory thrown in, which I hope we're going to hear about. First issued as a hardcover in 2013, the paperback edition was recently reissued in 2015. Dr. Tucker was raised Southern Baptist and never considered the possibility of past lives before reading one of Dr. Stevenson's books. He became so intrigued by Stevenson's research that he eventually gave up a successful private practice of child psychiatry to join him in the work. Tom Schroeder, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and author of Old Souls, Compelling Evidence from Children Who Remember Past Lives, which was published in 1999, wrote about Return to Life. Jim Tucker is a worthy successor to Dr. Ian Stevenson. He approaches these fascinating cases of children who appear to remember previous lives with an intelligent curiosity, sober judgment, and a real knack for telling a story, which is a good thing because these are great stories. All right, thank you very much, Nancy, and thanks to everyone for being here. It's, I got a letter one day from a mother in Oklahoma, and she said that she and her husband were just ordinary folks. She works in the county clerk's office, her husband's a police officer, but she was writing because her five-year-old boy, Ryan, for the last year, had talked about a life in Hollywood, and he would beg and cry plead for his mom to take him home to Hollywood. He was doing this on a daily basis and it had been going on for a year. So eventually, she checked some books out of the local library about Hollywood to see if he could, could look at things and it would help him kind of develop closure overall. So they were looking through one of the books one day when they got to a picture from an old movie called Night After Night. And uh, Ryan pointed to the second man on the, uh, from the left there and said, uh, hey, Melvin, that's George. We did a picture together. And then he pointed to the one on the far right and said, and hey, Melvin, that's me. I found me. Well, the first, pic the first fellow that he pointed to uh, was a young George Raft, who some people may know. He became a bit of a movie star. But the one on the right that he pointed to, it turned out was an extra who had no lines in the movie. So Ryan's mom could not figure out who that was. So she wrote to me to see if somehow I could help identify who this fellow was, which was very difficult to do. But as we were working on it, Ryan's mom would send an email, sometimes on a daily basis, recording all the statements that he was making about a past life. And, and he was describing quite an exciting life. He said how he had danced on stage in New York and uh, then he had gone to Hollywood where he'd worked in movies. Uh, he had started, uh, then he had then worked for an agency, said how he had seen the world from big boats and how he had a big house with a swimming pool. And frankly, I thought it all seemed quite unlikely for an extra with no lines in the movie. So eventually, some TV folks got involved and they couldn't figure out who this guy was either. But what they did eventually was hire a Hollywood archivist. And she went to the library of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences and went through all the materials that they had on Night After Night. Uh, most of it involved the stars of the movie, not just George Raft. It was also the um, first movie that Mae West was in. And eventually she came across this picture and the front of it says, night after night with George Raft and, and the other stars. 
on the back of it said, but the well-dressed racketeer will wear. Marty Martin playing a racketeer in Paramount's Night After Night with George Rapp and so forth gives a demonstration of underworld sartorial excellence. So after seeing that, I then went and, and watched Night After Night again uh, to make sure we had the right guy. And, and there were only two characters in the film who wore um, bowling hats, and the other one looked nothing like him. Uh, and eventually, Marty Martin's family confirmed that, in fact, this was who Ryan had pointed to. So we had figured out who this was, and it, it, this fellow Marty Martin. Now, I had thought it was quite unlikely that an extra would have the kind of life that Ryan described, but in fact, Marty Martin did. So uh, Ryan had said how he had danced on stage in New York, and uh, Marty Martin had danced on Broadway. And he said he then went to Hollywood and worked in movies, which Marty Martin did. Ryan said he worked for, uh, then worked at an agency. Well, Marty Martin started a successful talent agency and did quite well. Uh, Ryan said how he'd seen the, the world from big boats and he talked about going to Paris. Well, Marty Martin and his wife had taken the Queen Mary to Europe. Uh, they had visited Paris and uh, had their picture taken there. And Ryan said how he had a big house with a swimming pool, which Marty Martin did. Uh, Ryan said that his house had the word rock or street. I'm sorry, rock or mount in the street address. And Marty Martin lived on Roxbury. Um, another statement that Ryan had made was, uh, and this was early on, he said he didn't see why God would let you get to be 61 and then make you come back again as a baby. Well, Marty Martin's death certificate showed that he was 59 when he died. So it looked like that was a statement that Ryan was just off on. Uh, but then Marty Martin's daughter and stepson both said that no, he was actually 61. Uh, so I looked into it and I found a passenger list, three census records, and two marriage listings. And they all gave an age or date of birth uh, that would have made uh, Marty Martin, 61 when he died and not 59. So in this case, Ryan was right and the death certificate was wrong. Now I mentioned Marty Martin's daughter. I met her. She uh, was only eight when, when Marty Martin died. But I met with her and went through all the statements that Ryan had made. There was a lot she didn't know about her dad's life since she was so young when he died, but between meeting with her and reviewing public records, uh, we were eventually able to uh, confirm over 50 statements that Ryan had made that did in fact match Marty Martin. So that's one of the stories that, that I tell in, in my book, Return to Life. And it's the kind of case uh, that we've been studying here at the University of Virginia for over 50 years. Um, and as everyone probably knows, especially if they listen to Nancy's introduction, this work started here with Ian Stevenson. Uh, Ian came here to UVA to be chairman of the Department of Psychiatry in 1957. And when he interviewed, he told people that he had an interest in parapsychology, but he had a lot of other interests too, and, and nobody seemed to mind. So he got busy being chairman, and then he started hearing about cases from various parts of the world of young children who said that they remembered a past life. And he got intrigued enough where he went out and started investigating these cases, and then got more and more intrigued. He eventually stepped down as chairman and then spent the bulk of the next 40 years of his, his career studying these cases. And he found a lot of cases, and then he got some other folks involved, people that you all may know, Erlander Harrelson, Tony Mills, Jurgen Kyle, Satwan Pesricha. But altogether, we have now studied over 2,500 cases, again, from various parts of the world of, of these kids talking about the past life. And they are easiest to find in cultures with the belief in reincarnation. So I've, I've listed the countries where we've had the most cases. 
but we've had the most there because we've had associates looking for them there. And in fact, cases have been found wherever anyone has looked. Uh, they've been found on all the continents except Antarctica, uh, where obviously no one has looked. And that includes in the U.S., like with, with Ryan being an example. The cases seem to be harder to find here. Well, they are harder to find here. They, they seem less common here. Uh, but it may just be that they're harder to find because people don't talk about them here in the way that they do in other places. Families here tend to be a little embarrassed by what their kids are saying, so they, they sometimes don't tell a soul. And we've got plenty of cases here where the grandparents didn't even know about it. Uh, but with the internet, of course, people start looking up past life memories and, and they find us and, and then they email us or write to us. Uh, so, so we've been finding more and more American cases. So I joined this effort in, in the year 2000 and initially I, I continued the Asian work. I took several trips to Asia, but then I decided uh, to focus on cases here uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that the cases here don't have the cultural influences that, that may affect the cases in other places. Uh, and two, I felt like if a couple of thousand cases in Asia had not convinced people to seriously consider this work, that there was no number that would. Um, but I was hopeful that the American cases would get people's attention more, and I think they have gotten people's attention more. So in Return to Life, I, I, I spent one chapter talking about the cases I saw in Asia, uh, and also one um, a very interesting case from Scotland uh, that's available online. It, on YouTube, it's a documentary called The Boy Who Lived Before. But otherwise, I, I talk about the American cases. And uh, with Ryan being a good example, we, we just found some very interesting ones. Um, so regardless of whether they're from Asia or from here, there are various features that tend to recur in the cases. The cases typically involve very young children who spontaneously start talking about a past life. This work does not involve hypnotic regression, uh, but these kids just start coming out with these things, uh, typically describing very recent, uh, very ordinary lives. Now, when I say recent, Ryan's case is an exception to that because Marty Martin died 50 years before Ryan was born. Uh, but typically, it's much more, a uh, much shorter interval. So the the average interval between lives is four and a half years, uh, but the median interval, meaning half or shorter and half or longer, is only 16 months. So it's typically very recent lives. Uh, and ordinary lives, it, the kids are not talking about being kings or queens, or uh, they almost never talk about being famous people, uh, but they uh, typically describe somebody who lives close by, almost always in the same country. Now, some of them will describe a deceased family member like a grandparent or, or sometimes a sibling who's deceased. But others will describe strangers in other locations like Ryan did. And, and if they give enough details, like the name of that location, then people have often gone there and found that in fact somebody uh, did live and die whose life matches the statements that the child made. So in that situation, we say it's a solved case. Uh, if a child reports memories from a past life, uh, but no one's able to verify that they match one particular deceased person, then we'd say it's unsolved. Uh, we've got plenty of both kinds in our collection. The solved ones, of course, tend to be the more interesting ones, and then over half of them are solved. The one part of the life that, that of the past life that is often out of the ordinary is how the previous person died. So. 70% of the time, the previous person died by unnatural means, meaning uh, murder, suicide, combat, accident, that sort of thing. So that certainly seems to be uh, an important factor in these cases. Now, as far as the features go, one of the features that's present in a lot of the cases is when the child is born with birthmarks or birth defects that match wounds, usually the fatal wounds, on the body of the previous person. And uh, these cases really intrigued Ian. Ian had, had always been interested in, uh, even before he got involved in this work, had always been interested in uh, psychosomatic medicine, so the, the interplay between mind and body. Uh, so when he saw these, he, he 
got quite interested and devoted years to collecting and studying these cases. Uh, he eventually, after a long delay, published a book called Reincarnation in Biology. Uh, it's got over 200 of these cases, and, and in fact, it's 2,000 pages long. And of course, I, I will not review all 200 cases with you, but there's some really interesting ones in it. So uh, there's a little girl who uh, talked about the life of a man who had his, uh, got his fingers chopped off as he was being murdered. And uh, she was born with her hands looking like that. And then there was a, another little boy who talked about a uh, boy in another village who had lost the fingers of his right hand in a fodder chopping machine. And then this little boy has been born with his hands uh, looking like that. And that's quite an unusual birth defect, uh, the way one hand is, is affected so much and the other one is not. Ian also lists 18 cases in which the children were born with two birthmarks ones that match both the entrance and the exit wound on, on the body of somebody who's been shot. Also, Ian and I studied a case, and it was the first case I ever studied, actually. It's an American case that, that it, um, is the first chapter in, in Return to Life. A little boy with, uh, born with three, they weren't exactly birth forms, three lesions, uh, the mash lesions that uh, his deceased half-brother had, had experienced. And, and then this little boy started making a lot of statements about his deceased half-brother. So, Along with the birthmarks, of course, are the statements. And I mentioned that these are young children who talk about past lives. The typical age when they start is 35 months. So they're very young. They're, they're usually between the age of two and three around their, around their third birthday when they start coming out with these statements. And some of them will do it with sort of a sense of detachment, but, but others show very strong emotional involvement with this material. They, they may, uh, like Ryan did, uh, they may cry and beg to be taken to their previous family. Some of them will show a lot of anger, especially if the previous person was murdered. They, they can show a lot of anger as they talk about the killer. And some of these kids uh, seem to have access to this material at all times, but others have to be in the right mood for it. And, and so some will talk about this stuff with great intensity, but then a few minutes later, they just run off and play. And, and they often, it's often during relaxed times that they come out with this stuff. So after a warm bath or that sort of thing, they'll start talking about the past life. And then by the time the kids are six or seven, uh, they stop talking about the past life and, and then just go on with their lives. And we have thought that that they just they lost the memories, that they forget about the past lives. But a couple of years ago, Erlinger Haraldson did a study where he interviewed uh, adults who had been studied when they were children. Um, and he found a surprising number of said that they still had at least some memories of the past lives. So it may be that they, uh, I think they do, tend to fade, but for some of them, it may be they still have the memories kind of in the back of their minds, but they stop talking about them, and they get wrapped up in this life and going to school and, and having friends and that sort of thing. As far as what they talk about, uh, they don't tend to come out with uh, enlightened words of wisdom. Instead, what they do is typically focus on the end of the previous life. So three quarters of them will talk about how the previous person died. And they will also talk about people and events from uh, near the end of that life. So it's as if the memory has just sort of picked up or it left off at, at the end of the last life. And then about 20% of the kids will talk about events between lives, things that happened after they died in their last life and before they were so some of the kids will say that they stayed near the, the body after the person died, or that they stayed near the previous family. Uh, some of them will describe previous funerals, sometimes giving accurate details. There, there was one girl in Thailand who uh, made a lot of statements, but she complained that her ashes had been scattered rather than buried the way she wanted them to be. But it turned out the previous person 
had wanted her ashes buried under the bow tree of the temple complex where she studied. But when her daughter went to bury them, uh, the root system of the tree was so extensive she couldn't bury them. So, so she simply scattered them. Good. And then some of the kids will talk about going to other realms like heaven. Uh, the American kids may use the word heaven. Uh, Ryan described seeing his parents from heaven and, and gave some very accurate statements that really startled his mom. Um, he said how from heaven he saw that a doctor did a test on her and said that she was going to have a boy and she got really angry and told him he was wrong and then she went out to dinner with her husband and cried through the whole dinner. And it turned out that when Ryan's parents got married, his dad had been married before and had kids from his first marriage, so they agreed that they would just have one child for themselves. And Ryan's mom desperately wanted a little girl. Uh, so when she had the ultrasound that showed a boy, she did get upset at the doctor. Uh, then she and her husband went out to eat because it's her husband's birthday, uh, and she cried throughout the whole dinner. Uh, she had always felt extremely ashamed of how she had reacted, and it, it's certainly hard to imagine that she ever told Ryan about it, and yet he uh, ultimately told her about it. So along with the statements, uh, there are also uh, behaviors that a lot of these kids show. So I've mentioned that a lot of them show emotions, uh, and they will, they will also show emotions that are appropriate for the relationship that the a previous person had with individual family members. So a little girl may be very deferential toward the previous husband or the previous parents, uh, but very bossy toward the younger siblings, even though those younger siblings are much older than the child is. These emotions will usually fade as, as the statements do, uh, but not always. Uh, there's at least one case where the little boy eventually grew up to marry the widow of the previous person. Uh, even though obviously she was quite a bit older than he was. Phobias. In, in over 35% of the cases where the previous person died an unnatural death, the child was shown intense fear toward that mode of death. So, for instance, there was a little girl who, from the time she was born, she hated being in the water. Uh, it would take three adults to hold her down to give her a bath when she was an infant. Uh, and then once she got older enough to talk, uh, she described the life of a girl in, in another village who had uh, drowned in an accident. Attraction to addictive substances. Uh, this picture, if you can see, it's a uh, kid smoking a cigarette. Uh, this is not one of our cases, but uh, it could be because, unfortunately, uh, if the previous person was a big smoker or drinker, uh, the child will show an interest in, in the addictive substance. So uh, there'll be cases where children are trying to sneak cigarettes, or even sneak liquor. Uh, there was one case where a neighbor was letting the child have liquor until the uh, family found out about it and stopped it. Themes in the play. A lot of these kids will show themes that seem related to the past life, most often the occupation of the previous person. So uh, there's one little boy who played compulsively for hours on end at being a biscuit shopkeeper, which is what the previous person was doing. And he played it so much that he refused to do anything else, including schoolwork. Uh, and he fell behind, and, and his mom felt like he was probably never able to catch up. And then cross-gender behavior. About 10% of the children will describe the life as a member of the opposite sex. And in those cases, many of the children will show uh, gender confusion or gender dysphoria uh, of, of wanting to be the opposite sex. And those things will sometimes fade as the child gets older, but sometimes not. I mean, there are some adults who are still showing those traits, uh, but, but others not. Uh, but for the most part, all of these things fade as, as the statements do. And the, the kids just get wrapped up in this life and, and go on to live perfectly ordinary lives uh, just like everybody else. But these, these behaviors, uh, one thing I think we should note is that they indicate uh, not just kind of a connection to past life, but they also suggest that it's not just memories that seem able to survive after death and carry on, but it may be that feelings and emotions uh, carry on. So, what do we make of, of these cases? Well, at the end of, of Return to Life, uh, I explore this a little bit, and I conclude that, that we ha now have 
significant evidence, uh, that slide obviously is not the way it was designed to be, uh, but we now have significant evidence that some young children do have memories that have carried on from a past life. And certainly in our cases, it seems that previous person died, their consciousness continued on, and then was, was born into a new life. Uh, but I think it's worth pointing out that these may well be special cases, and, and they are special in the sense that there are intact memories that came through, and that the previous person typically died violently or died young and then came back very quickly. Uh, so what we see in our cases with intact memories may not be representative of the usual process. So our cases may be essentially one end of the bell curve, that, that line there is supposed to be um, near one end of the bell curve. And it, it may be that what happens after we die can include all kinds of, of different sorts of experience. Um, and, and it's not just coming back to this world, but, but it may be various kinds of world or even various kinds of experiences. So I think it, it may be more varied than we can really imagine. And I would say in the overall picture uh, that the consciousness may even be bigger than we can imagine. In fact, I, I argue in Return to Life in what uh, I devoted a chapter to physics and, and uh, there seems to be consensus that that's either the best or worst chapter in the book. But I, I make the case that quantum physics has shown that, that the physical world is a creation of consciousness. So the consciousness is primary and the physical world grows out of it. And I'm certainly not the only person who has said that. There was Sir James Jeans who had a, a well-known quote, the universe begins to look more like a great thought than like a great machine. Mind no longer appears as an accidental intruder into the realm of matter. We are beginning to fact that we ought rather to hail it as the creator and governor of the realm of matter. And then Max Planck, who is considered the father of quantum physics, uh, he once said, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as derivative of consciousness. We cannot get behind consciousness. So on that note, I will stop and I will see if people have questions. Thanks, Jim. That was wonderful. It's a pleasure to hear you talk about your work. Um, I'm uh, opening it up to questions. So if you guys want to put your questions in the in the uh, chat box, that would be great. And I'm also going to open this slide that has some of the questions that we've been asking. Um, you've obviously talked about the content of the book, and we know that you've written books on this subject before. But this particular book was it was the motivation only what you said to to bring out more American cases, or did you have another uh, goal for the book as well? Well, to be honest, the my primary goal was was this end of the book, this idea of, of what physics says about consciousness and how consciousness should really be considered. Uh, the primary core of reality. And um, in fact, I, I did a, a book proposal for a book on that and nobody wanted to publish it. But, but then I realized that I had enough American cases where uh, those really, I think, add to the literature and, and then hopefully will make people more open to saying, well, there is something going on with consciousness and then we can consider uh, what, what physics has to say. Mm -hmm. That's a good strategy. How how is the uh, oh wait let me roll down here because Shirley's got a got a question. She says I remember Bruce was saying in a lecture that there was a study to compare facial geometry of deceased persons to their possible reincarnated reincarnated selves. Did anything ever ever come of that study? Well, that's not one that we've done. There there are other people who have looked at that sort of thing. There's a fellow named Paul von Ward. And, and then there's also, um, there's a physician who has written about, uh, Return of the Revolutionaries, where he, he uh, thinks that he was John Adams in the past life. I'm blocking on his name. Uh, but he argued that people look like their, their previous people. 
what we have found in our cases is that some of the children do bear a resemblance to the previous person, but uh, many of the others do not. So it's, it's hard for them to make it that. I, I think the spatial architecture thing, uh, I mean, what Paul von Ward says is that's only one piece to consider. Um, I don't think the technology is such that we really can can draw a whole lot of conclusions from them. Mm -hmm. And Carlos is asking, uh, have you found cases in which the children use languages that they have not learned? Yeah, I mean, that would be what's called xenoglossy. And there are a couple of cases that have involved xenoglossy. I mean, that's extremely rare where somebody would have full capabilities of another language. And, and the cases where they have shown that have been, I'd say, unusual cases. But there seems to be something there. But but I can't say that we've had a perfect case yet that involves xenoglossy. We have a couple of other people writing. Gonzalo was asking earlier the person who ended up marrying their previous personality. Which one of the cases was that? Oh my God. Marrying the widow of the previous personality. Yeah, it's one of Ian's cases. I think it's in reincarnation of biology. Uh, oh, okay. But I, I mentioned that case in my first book, Life Before Life, and I cite the reference in that one. I, I don't remember all the names. Okay. And then Ariane was saying, I remember reading somewhere in one of these parapsychology sessions that there is evidence that the interval between lives appears to vary between cultures. Have you heard anything about this? Now that's definitely true. And, well, it's definitely true that, that looking at cases from those areas, it, it varies. And it typically follows the belief of the culture. So there are some places who think that switch comes right at conception. So they go looking for cases where a child is born nine months after somebody died. Uh, there are other places where they think it happened that the death, that there's no interval, that there's the death and birth uh, simultaneously. So they look, again, look for cases where, where there is a match. So it, it may well just be kind of a sampling process uh, where there's this mm -hmm. difference. Now, I will say with the American ones, there seems to be more American cases with longer intervals. So, you know, Ryan's was 50 years. James Leininger, which is a well-known case, that was 60 years. I don't know what to make of that. But uh, it's something that we should probably take a closer look at. Wait, folks with um, longer intervals, do they ever mention that there was something in between that they're not fixating on? I mean, is it a, is it a question of actually having an interval or maybe maybe having a, a, a past life that's in there that they know something about, but they're not folks? Yeah, that's possible. I mean, some of the kids talk about more than one past life, and I mean, it would seem odd that you would remember one, have another one, forget it, and then remember the first one again. But it's possible that the yeah, first exactly. one ended traumatically, you know, that those memories would, would stick with you more. You know, who knows? Yeah. Um, Shirley is saying, are memories of past lives more common in child prodigies? Well, not that we know of. I mean, certainly we have speculated, Ian speculated in the paper in Medical Hypotheses, that child prodigies could gain some of their abilities from past lives, but I'm not aware of any of the well-known prodigies who have said that they that they remember past lives. Now, in return to life, I have one case of a little boy who, and it's kind of a long story, but but thought, thought that he was Bobby Jones, the, the golfer from back in like the 20s. And this kid, oh, he is virtually a golfing prodigy, and he's uh, kept up with the dad and, and He's won, I think, over a hundred tournaments now, and he's still only nine or ten. So that one would be close to a prodigy, and, and he did have memories from the past life. But you know, Mozart and, and all the various prodigies, no, maybe no one's ever asked, but but there's no report. Yeah, they're not spontaneously mentioning it. Ariana is saying, do you have an opinion on past life regression? Um, I do. We tend to be quite skeptical of it because hypnosis, whether for memories in this life or in past lives, it tends to be quite an unreliable tool. There are times, like for memories of this life, where it's amazing, people recall license plate numbers from crime scenes or whatever. Uh, but there are plenty of cases where the mind is filled in the blanks with fantasy. Now, that's not to say that past life regression can't be therapeutic, I and mean, I think it may be a therapeutic process. And there are very rare exceptions where there seems to be evidence of actual knowledge from a past life, but those are extremely rare, and I, and I think the vast well, the vast majority clearly there's no evidence uh, that it actually is a past life that persons recall, and, and there are many cases where 
clearly fantasy because it, uh, the things that they are, are reporting, you know, could not possibly happen. Uh, again, it, it may, there may well be times where people access past lives, but there are a lot of times where it makes certain things. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of fertile for other kinds of combinations of fantasy and maybe fact. Yeah, maybe yeah. Not. So, so what's next? Well, I'm not sure. I mean, we certainly are trying to collect more strong American cases, and I think if, you know, if we can, if we hit the 50 really strong American cases, then boy, that, you know, if they were all as strong as Ryan and James Leininger, that would be pretty hard to dismiss. Yeah. And, I mean, when Return to Life, when it got some publicity, certainly we heard from a lot of American parents. Unfortunately, you know, the cases aren't always so strong, and, and with the American parents, and it, it seems remarkable to them that the child says anything about that life. So that, you know, they may just make a few statements. Uh, but if they don't give names or places, then there's usually no way to verify them. So anyway, we're, we're going to continue to try to work on those. We're also continuing to explore the, the database that we have for all these cases where, as you all know, we've worked on coding a very long time. We're still working on it, but we've, we've got over 2,000 of the cases coded now. So. We can certainly look at patterns. One thing I was always curious about is, is among the unsolved cases, do you have people re- reporting on a past life as an animal or an insect or something other than a human um, being? Occasionally. Not very often, but occasionally. In fact, I've got a couple of those in my book, uh, in return to life, including a bizarre snake case. But, uh, I mean, those are typically quite unverifiable. But, but right. some of them are interesting. So, you know, that frankly seemed weird even to Ian when he started studying these. But, it, but he eventually took them, tried to take them seriously, but for but very few reports, even though a lot of the places where he was collecting cases, people did believe that you could go from animal to human or vice versa. Uh, so he felt the fact that he was not hearing it always never that it was more than just yeah. following the cultural clues. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually why I asked it, because I've, I've I've heard of that, that, that the tradition holds that you can run up and down the, 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 the scale, yeah, and, sort of. Well, I do um, think uh, that these cases with intact memories, typically it seems to be, it has to be a, a pretty closely connected life. So usually the same country, usually quite recent. So for an animal, it, it may well be that people experience being animals and they experience being humans. But the, the divide is too great for the memories. Well, uh, this has been wonderful. And anybody else have any more questions? We've only got a couple more minutes, and then we, we want to give people a, a break before the uh, 4 o'clock. Any more questions, folks? Okay. Some people are, in, are writing. Yeah, you can also express um, happiness at, at this because it's a great presentation. Well, it was really good. Thank it's you and thanks to everybody for, for wanting to look. Thank you very much. I'm going to close off the, the, the lecture and we'll be back at 4 o'clock with uh, Ed May. So um, thank, thank you. you very much, Jim. Thanks. Great, great job.